This week on the Computer Chronicles, Computers and the Disabled. We'll show you a talking word processor that speaks what you type. Can a blind person surf the web? The answer is yes, with tools like JAWS and Outspoken. And some websites are friendlier than others when it comes to accessibility. We'll show you some examples. Plus, Cyberlink, a way to control your computer with your thoughts. We'll also visit a class where technology brings enrichment to people with disabilities. And we'll take you to a Ronald McDonald house where the web brings joy to seriously ill children. All this plus Giles Online, this week's computer news, my pick of the week. It's all coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by SoftSource Incorporated, publishers of Pro One Software, educational software for young adults. And by Upside, the business magazine for the technology elite. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Computers and the Internet are wonderful inventions, but have you ever thought about what it would be like to use a computer if you were blind or physically disabled? There's the screen to deal with, the mouse, and the keyboard. Fortunately, many people are working to make PCs and the net available to everyone, and one of those people is Lisa Wall. Lisa, I guess the basic problem is this interface issue, and you've brought some solutions to that here. Let's talk about these. What problems, say, do these trackballs solve? Well, the mouse is a barrier, and trackballs are a little more accessible. They can be large. You could use it with your feet. They so can this be is really easy to deal with? Very small, and if you could just move your thumb so a quarter a, of an inch, yeah. you could still use it. Okay, now these are basically just on-off switches. How do I use those? These switches with the right software will allow you to do everything on the computer that you can normally do with a keyboard and a mouse. You can go through a, a keyboard on the screen, hot Just spots. through a series of yes-no, yes-no choices. Right. And you could use this if you can only move your head a little bit, right? You could press a button like that. Switches can be in any size, any shape. Yeah. You could have one that if you lift your, your eyebrow, it would activate sure. the switch. All right, now what about this, this little keyboard? What problem does this solve? Keyboards, again, don't have to look like this. They can look any way we want them to do. Squishes all the keys together, um, puts the vowels and the frequently used consonants right in the middle so that you don't have to move very far So at less all. demanding on the motor control skills. If all you had was one finger and you couldn't move it very far, this would speed you up tremendously. Yeah. Now here's another great idea, which is this keyboard and telekeys, and how do I use this? The power of this is that the keyboard can be anything you want it to be. It doesn't have to be single letters, it can be entire words. Answers to a question, choices, things you would want the computer to say to other people. So I could be interacting. And you can put different templates in here and redefine this, obviously. What's that one? These are all the commands you would need for living books. That's all you need. You don't need all these choices. Right. And finally, one, one I really like, which is incredible, you can do a whole physics experiment here with this. We're putting words and sentences under the buttons. And so with three button hits, you can write up the results of your experiment, mm -hmm. spend more time doing science, and less time keyboarding. All right, now up here on the screen, we have a, a new piece of software called IntelliTalk. And how do we use this, and what problem does it solve, Lisa? Well, this is a talking word processor. Uh, this is very powerful for people with learning disabilities. Um, people learning how to type can have uh, letter by letter feedback. Okay, hi. Uh, they can turn that off and have word by word feedback. Speak sent. Or just speak the sentences to proofread your work, to have another channel of information. All right, so again, if you have problems with vision or if you have learning disabilities, this is an easier way to handle entering in, uh, input from a normal keyboard. Well, it, this, is, this is some of the software that's going to help you out. Uh, and okay, now what's nice about the software is this is relatively inexpensive. Some of these solutions are, are, are expensive, right? Well, a lot of this special technology can be very high. A talking word processor can be as little as uh, $39, $49. Which is what this one is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, finally, you guys have also come up with a real resource guy, which I would think is very valuable for uh, using computers for people with disabilities. Uh, what's inside here? strategies, where to find some of these things. They're, you're not going to find them at the standard at stores. At CompUSA or your normal store, yeah. And uh, guidance to uh, 40 grassroots centers where people can go and get their hands on this technology. And where can you get the book? Most bookstores. Okay, great. Lisa, thank you very much. 
Well, there are several approaches, as we've seen, to using technology to help people who are disabled. One is to find interfaces and control devices that lower the barriers of usage for disabled people. Another approach is to simply use the power of PCs to give those with disabilities a better life. In a small San Diego studio near the Pacific Ocean, three advanced art students perfect their skills with the help of their teacher and their computers. They discovered their talent at an early age but couldn't communicate or express themselves until later in life. Mark and Christina are autistic savants, while Philip was born with Down syndrome. I learned a freehand sketch. Freehand like this. Draw on the tablets, my own tablets at home. Then I come here. To watch them work is to see three distinct talents and three different styles that developed in part on their digital palettes. The artist's tools of choice are simple and unobtrusive. A compact drawing tablet from Wacom Technology and Dabbler, a paint program from Fractal Design. One main thing is you, you don't have the, the toxicity that a lot of these people can't be around oil paints and certain types of media that you're not having to deal with that. The three artists are already famous. Their paintings decorate cards, books, shirts, and walls. The images are inspired and original. Some of it is very childlike, but some of it's also very sophisticated, and it's kind of a combination of the two that you, you get with this. And um, Christina, she's a savant, which means that she's, uh, in certain areas, she is genius or um, above average, you know, in certain things. In her artwork, she has a natural perspective skill that she's never really been taught perspective, but when she draws her buildings, she has this perspective downright. Kathleen's star pupils are usually deep in concentration when working at their terminals, but they do think about the effects of their work. It's fun to watch people look at the, look at those pictures of uh, pets, and fun to watch them be happy. And it can, and it feels like you might might want to see them get happy, um, become happy, or not as lonesome. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Laurie Anderson. The Internet and the World Wide Web are incredible tools for information and fun, but how do you navigate the web if you can't see? That's the problem Peter Cantasani had to deal with. And Peter, how do you deal with the problem? Explain the hardware and the software you use to deal with this. Well, what I use uh, basically is standard a computer with Windows 95, um, and attached to that would be uh, DeckTalk Express speech synthesizer. That's a little here. box we have sitting here. Right, that's connected through a serial port to the computer. And in the computer, I have some software called a screen reader in a generic sense. But what it really does is it intercepts whatever the operating system is doing and it interprets it in a way so that it, um, you can see it uh, by hearing it, ah, so to okay. speak. Um, it tells you when a window opens. Yeah. It tells you the name of the window. It tells you what elements are in there, Sports. if there's a list box or whatever. Okay. On the World Wide Web, web you'd have things like uh, a website with links and so on, so you could basically Weather browse check. through it. Right. But Show us actually how you would do that, Peter. I'm going to just turn the volume Weather up on your synthesizer right a bit here. here. And we're up on the yeah, CNN website. And Weather you just CNN. go to work and, and just sort of describe what you're doing. Okay, so right now I'm going to invoke the JAWS cursor, which is basically my browsing mode. I can move around the screen and go to the top. This is the menu. And there's a symbol that says scroll up, so I know that you can... Today on CNN, size Super Bowl preview, 11 p.m. S. Okay, so I would have would have basically just read the line. I can actually read that by word. And let's say I wanted to I want to read this word and I want to spell it. And it changed the pitch because the capital was T. Now that's all capital. And so on, and I can actually have it read uh, perhaps the whole page if I want. If I hit the page down key, I can... Party on Bourbon Street. Yeah. Destinations down on the bayou. Now, how do you NBA deal with knowing where type. a hot link is, knowing where a graphic is? Okay, uh, with a hot link, I can just tab because there's a macro that's built into the JAWS that lets me tab to a hot link. Sights and sounds. 
There's one, right? Party on Bourbon Street, exclaim. Okay, let's, if I wanted to get that one, I could just hit enter, and it would go get Party to that. Party on Bourbon Street. Okay. So you can identify the hot link and then use the hot link. Right. And I also have clicking well, cues. I can... Out ahead. It's party time. Well, and so it's, it's coming in, and as it's coming in, it's reading it. Quickly, Peter, uh, there's another one that you have, another screen reader called Outspoken. If you could load that one up and show us what the differences are between JAWS, Jaws. and Outspoken. Oh, okay. Uh, I just got rid of JAWS. JAWS. Quit JAWS for with. Man yeah. Up. Okay, that's gone. And now I'm going to bring up Outspoken. I'll just do it with the run dialog. And... Outspoken's difference mostly is that it changes the voices to give you different kinds of information. So this is the system voice that, that's outspoken telling you something. Okay, so let's say we're um, now that's outspoken telling me it went to the top. Now I hit a, a, a graphic. I don't know what it is because I haven't um, found out what that graphic is, but I can either find out by asking someone or whatever. Space, space. Um, From and notice how the time. voice went back to a different. This That's is the cool. standard so voice. So different voices tell you it's doing different things and right. looking if, at different. If you're things. hitting a graphic, it's going to be a high-pitched voice or whatever voice you want. And a regular text would be another voice. New Orleans left for MCN and right for MCN. And the other thing that this uh, program can do on the fly, sort of, is would be uh, reading quote columns. Quote if we had a column day. on the screen, I could find the top of the column and just read straight down uh -huh. that column. That's one of the problems with the web. You'd have column side sure. by side. If you read them as a line, it just doesn't make any sense. Peter, obviously we're not used to using an interface like this here, but you've said, in fact, once you get going here, I mean, you can do some things faster than if you had a mouse in your hand. That's true. <laughs> I, I can do that. If I know uh, where I'm going with it, uh, let's say I wanted to, uh, let me just minimize this and show you. I want to go to the desktop. Yeah. Um, let's say I just hit uh, taskbar. Taskbar. And disconnect. Uh, let's say if I wanted to, so I just went there and chose the button for details. I, I did it very quickly without having yeah, to go move the sure. mouse around. All right, Peter, thank you very, very much. So one solution to making the web more accessible is the use of special tools that overcome the requirements of sight or fine motor control. Another approach is to just design a website so that it is easier for people with disabilities to use. And Michael, that's what I know you guys have done at your organization. And you have your website up here. When you look at it, it just looks like kind of any other old website. But explain to us what are the qualities and features of this homepage that really make it easier for a disabled person to use? Well, it's important, obviously, to understand that uh, designing a website for a person with disabilities doesn't have to be different than the average user. Mm -hmm. And here's a good example. You've got good color usage. Uh, in fact, underneath uh, the complete environment of this particular web page, the uh, Rubinsky Insight Foundation web page, all the alternative text is provided there for each one of the icons so that they can jump back simply. So a reader screen. has text to deal with. A screen reader, Absolutely. as we just saw, can work with something. Right. Now, also, there's a lot of white space. These things are separated quite a bit. That's part of the design. Excellent huh? visual uh, visualization here. Okay. Now, uh, there's another site I think you want to show us, which is the NCAM site. Mm -hmm the National Center for Accessible Media at WGBH in Boston, mm -hmm. and they've taken a different approach. Rather than just providing alternative text underneath uh, the imagery, they've actually provided through these uh, simple links a complete description in text. So again, now a person who's blind or visually impaired can read that text completely of the whole page and it provides complete background. So every image is not just an image, but has a text description so the screen reader, again, can have information to, to convey to the user. Exactly. All right, what else does it do besides that? Well, obviously, those that are blind and visually impaired aren't the only ones that are having a difficult time with the web. Also, uh, the deaf have a, a, a particular problem with accessing anything that might be video that doesn't provide captioning. Mm -hmm. So here, by, through the use of transcripts, a complete transcript of the page of a particular video a multimedia event, uh, those that are deaf or those that are blind have a transcript of a, of a multimedia okay, so event. So even with an AVI video clip or whatever you're doing with the video, there's a full transcript for people who can't uh, see it so they could uh, read it or have it read to them. That's right, and exactly. And then as we can see here through the opening of that particular file, that event, now a person who's deaf can play the event, and you'll see underneath the clip, 
the, the captioning that goes along with these. So you're really helping disabled people in two ways. If you're deaf, you've got the closed captioning. If you're blind, you've got the text so that the screen reader can read it. Right. Exactly. That's great. Michael, thank you very much. Well, we've seen examples of websites that are more user-friendly to people with disabilities, but there are also websites that are specifically designed to provide a service to ill or disabled people. One very good example is a site run by Apple Computer called Convomania. Tuna, Reptile, and Cowboy are not really the names of these kids staying at the Ronald McDonald House in Palo Alto, California. Those are chat room aliases used by the residents to talk to other children online on an Apple computer website called Convomania. The Ronald McDonald House is a residence for families of children who need medical care far from home. This house near the Stanford Medical Center was one of the first equipped with Macintoshes and modems to put the kids online. While the computers offer a choice of software, communicating seems to be the biggest hit. The thing that is most popular is the chat room. And that's because it lets the kids get out of here, into the world, talking with other kids whom they get to know. Uh, they, you know, as long as they don't change their aliases every day, they start knowing these people as individuals even though they've never met. They can send private messages to them, which they have a lot of fun doing. And they can, they rally around each other. If someone says he's sick or she isn't feeling well that day or has to go back in the hospital, they're very supportive. The Convo Mania website offers different ways for visitors to communicate and express themselves, including a message board called Share It, a chat room called Say It, and Spray It, a digital graffiti wall. Kids can also ask tough questions in Solve It. The site seems to have become a way for kids to become more open about their illnesses. I think we use uh, the program to learn more about the kids, and I think some of that. Um, a couple of parents have turned to me and said since the kids got on the chats, they spoke more openly about their medical problems, and it made it easier for them at home to discuss things openly with the kids, and that is a big plus. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Laurie Anderson. To operate a computer or a web browser, you generally need to move a mouse, click buttons, or manipulate a keyboard with your hands. For many people, that is very difficult to do, so one very clever inventor has come up with a totally new approach to the human-computer interface. And Andrew, that is you. And your idea is what? To use the mind and your thoughts rather than your hands as a controller? Well, actually using electrical signals from my forehead, the result of minute muscle activity and the brain activity. So I use those signals to control the computer. And so you have a headband on, which is like this headband over here, which is plugged into this amplifier box, which is plugged into the serial port of the computer. Right. That is your input device. Correct. All right, now we've got a keyboard up on the screen, and you're going to be able to try to move that cursor and select those words and type a sentence just by whatever it is you're doing with your forehead. Right. So try to tell us what you're doing. If, I know it's hard to talk and do this at the same okay, time. Okay, so I'm going to... I just selected I, and I'll select another word, like, you know, building a sentence, basically. So I'd say I went, went. jumping, and I could go into the sea. So, so you were moving the cursor and clicking, basically, That's on correct. those words as you did it. All right, why don't you load up the next thing you're going to show us, and we can talk while you do that. Yeah. If you can, we're going to get to a different kind of keyboard here in a second. What are you doing? I mean, how are you trying to move that cursor? And what did you do to click on those words? What I was doing, again, using these minute voltages at the forehead, and I'm doing a combination of that left, right, and up, down movement using the energy at my forehead, combination of uh, tension, relaxation. Energy meaning relaxing the muscles Correct. or tensing up the muscles, basically? That's correct. So that theoretically, even if you had no use of, of limbs, you could still do that. That's right. So let me go to another set of software where I'm going to select myself as a user. And now let me go right to the screen that shows the anatomy of these signals at my forehead. So the what low, are we seeing here? The lower trace is a time history of yeah. what we call brain-body signal. For example, I can make it really big and I can make it small. So we're seeing real-time what you're doing with your head right now. That's right. And then if I can 
consciously change the heights of these bars at the top, which we call brain fingers, then I can use those to map to the X and Y movement of a cursor. And actually use these as function keys in a way, huh, with your thoughts? That's right. In addition, you know, once we've got that, the t upper ones we call analog signals, the lower one now is a, a, a switch. See, for example, when I lift my eyebrow slightly, I have a switch. Ah, so you can do that also. Right. Now let me show this. I'll show you a pull-down menu. Now it, the computer's scanning through it. For example, I could use this when I get to a, uh, for example, typing. I just chose to do typing. Uh huh. And now this is an on-screen a scanning technique. Of so again, keyboard. you're scanning down or across that keyboard right. and picking a letter. So I'm going to type hello. Hello world is what everybody usually does. Okay. We'll just do hello given the time. And again, you're saying go right. Take that E. Uh, what the computer is moving, I'm saying I'm going to select okay, an L. Okay, the computer is moving the cursor. You're just saying when you select it. Right. Okay. So, for example, I can now exit. Got it. All right, last thing I want you to do is just to really show what you can do. You actually have an interface controller in which you could actually turn on a switch, which would be to turn on this lamp. That's correct. Here. So let me exit this up. routine. I go back to that pull-down menu. And now the computer is cycling through the menu. When I get to the thing called switch select, mm -hmm. You're going to mind I select click that. It. Yeah, I mind click it. Now I'll be going to a display. You did it. I know it's a lot of work. Take some training. Thanks very much, Andrew. Sure. Well, if you're interested in the subject of computers and the disabled, there are lots of online resources, even including disability shareware. For a review of what's out there, let's turn to our webmaster, Giles Bateman. Thanks, Stuart. There is a great volume of information about disabilities available online. And one of the things I noticed throughout most of, of these different sites is the way they spell disability. They capitalize the A in the middle, so it's dis ability, uh, i.e. their empowering functionality that was taken away by a disability. Now there are some great online services and what I think the best place to start is is disability information and resources. This is one of the biggest collections of links to all the different uh, disability sites on the internet. Everything from products and, and medical services to uh, here you see politics, different uh, different things, all the different things you might want to look up about disabilities. This is a great place to start. Now, if you use, uh, if you are a disabled computer user, you might be interested in some shareware or freeware. Here's the Macintosh Disability Shareware and Freeware page. It's maintained by a disabled uh, computer user who uses a Macintosh. A lot of these things are for uh, free. A lot of them were not originally created to address a disability, but wind up being very effective. Uh, the, the list just goes on and on. Most of them, the ones here with the red box, are in fact free. And if you don't use a Mac, in fact, you use a different uh, type of PC, you'll definitely want to know about the Adaptive Computing Software Project. Uh, this talks about all the different ways in which computers can aid uh, people with disabilities, and they also have their own archive of shareware and freeware, as well as links to other uh, people who maintain shareware and freeware archives. Thanks, Giles. It's time now for our weekly summary of the latest internet and computer news. Here's this week's random access report with Lori Anderson. In the random access file this week, America Online is conducting trials with U.S. Robotics X2 modems in several major cities. The new 56K technology provides online services at speeds nearly twice as fast as those currently available over standard phone lines. AOL members can check the special site at the keyword X2 for access numbers. Cyber Promotions figured out a way to get their commercial ads out to Internet users. The controversial mass emailer will launch their own email-friendly Internet provider this month. And there's a new place to go for used computers. Big Blue opened the IBM refurbished computer warehouse online. If you don't see what you're looking for today, remember systems and models change routinely. And tired of rushing to the airport only to find out your flight's delayed? Sign up for Travelocity's flight paging service. You'll be paged an hour before departure with current gate information. The service is currently free, but you must have an alphanumeric pager with nationwide paging capability. Claris is introducing a special version of its Claris Works software just for kids. The new integrated software is designed for grades K through 5. A free beta test Mac OS version of Claris Works for Kids will be available online to download this spring. 
And finally, if you're spending April in Paris or just want to brush up on your high school Spanish, you can now study online. Language Connect University provides the flexibility of a self-study program with the structure and interaction of a class through their website. New classes begin every Monday. That's it for this week's Random Access. Back to you, Stuart. Now for my pick of the week. Even if you're not disabled, having to use a keyboard to communicate with a computer is often a cumbersome way to enter information. For years on this show, we've been demonstrating various speech recognition programs that promise to improve on that situation by letting you just talk to your computer. Now at last, there is a new program out. It's called Simply Speaking from IBM that actually seems to work. You use it with Windows 95 and you really can dictate routine correspondence. Let me try to demonstrate it for you. I always get nervous trying to show off a speech recognition program because they usually do not work, period. Stop dictation. The program does occasionally make some mistakes, but once you correct them, it does tend to learn from its mistakes, and it usually doesn't make the same mistake twice. Also, I was using this program without any training whatsoever. You can spend time training the system to improve its recognition, but even if you do make some errors, it's relatively easy to correct them. You may not want to use this for heavy-duty work, but for only $75, including this headset, this is one terrific product. It's Simply Speaking from IBM. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll be back here again next week with more of the best in computer CD-ROM software and the Internet. And if you need more information on anything you saw on today's show, just check out our website at PCTV.com. I'm Stuart Chaffee. We'll see you here next time. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by SoftSource Incorporated, publishers of Pro One Software, educational software for young adults. and by Upside, the business magazine for the technology elite. To order a videotape of this program, call 1-800-916-PCTV. Please ask for tapes by show number and title. And for more help in keeping up with the fast-changing world of personal computing, order the Chaffee Letter. Each month, Stuart writes in detail about topics covered on Computer Chronicles and includes his commentaries on the technology that directly affects how you use your computer. For a videotape or a subscription to the Chaffee Letter, call 1-800-916-PCTV. The Chaffee Letter, your solution to information overload.